Hello and welcome to another episode of the Self Made Podcast and the first episode I can record with COVID. So I knew it wouldn't take long, back in the UK for less than a week and already have tested positive. But making use of the house arrest and getting the podcasts back up and running and producing much more content for you guys. And on this episode, we have a treat of getting my client Jack Halley on to talk about his photo shoot prep. If you follow me on Instagram, you've seen the incredible results this man got. He truly is a man that took real ownership. And that's what we spend most of this episode talking about. We talk about the importance of getting a coach and having those extra eyes and extra accountability, no matter whether you're a beginner or a coach yourself looking to push to the next level. We talk about sustainability. And it's diet's really meant to be sustainable where's that line between sustainability and taking true ownership to ensure that you get the results we then talk about things like social circles how to say no on social occasions and how important is that and how to zoom out and look at the bigger picture as well as talking about the diet after the diet how do you make sure that you once you finish and that deadline is over how do you manage to keep your results for life and keep structure this is a fantastic episode and there's so many good bits of information if you're looking to go into a dieting phase or you're in a dieting phase looking to come out. As always, if you enjoyed the show, please leave a review on iTunes, Spotify or your favourite podcast platform and drop us a share on Instagram, Facebook or whatever your favourite social media platform is, tagging in myself and Jack and I'll put his handle in the show notes. But without further ado, I'll leave you with myself and Jack Halley. So, Jack, this is an interesting episode. Like it's the first time in over a year I missed a Monday because of traveling back and I'm now going to be doing an episode, the first time ever, an episode with COVID. So um, you might have to do most of the talking on this one. But um, this is the second time that I've had a client on the show. But I generally think this is going to be a really, really interesting episode because of the the, the, sto- the shoot prep that you've just gone through and the things that you've learned along the way with your first shoot prep. And it's been so long since... I did my first one. I can't even remember this stage. So I think this will be really, really interesting. So before we go into a little bit about your prep and some of the things we want to discuss on the show, tell us a little about who you are and you know what, what brings you on the show. Yeah, cool. So I've been a PT for about five years. I've been mostly I did a lot of online stuff just because of the situation I was in because I work as a Sparky as well. Um, so this last year, so I moved to Stirling, like, moved to a different city in 2019. And I kind of decided at this point, like, right, I want to make a go of this. And blah, 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 because of everything kind of happened, it ended up even being last year. I was like, right, I'm going to do a photo shoot once I kind of get into a better position. And because I had a couple of niggles, things like that, and I didn't want to just like go into it and look, you know, rubbish. I want to take a bit of time to build, build a bit of muscle. So basically in January, I decided to do the photo shoot prep stuff. And then it came to like the kind of the near end. And I was like, I need someone that's going to, that's going to know a wee bit more about this than me. That's done this before. Because I was a bit naive, like, yeah, okay, I've dieted before and I've looked good for going on holiday, but this this was different. This was like, I needed someone's eyes to be like, no, nah, you're not lean enough yet. You need to keep digging. Because you know yourself, you look in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I'm lean. You know, I look good. But then, like I said, when I onboarded with you, it was like, right, we're up in cardio from once a week to four times a week. We need to nail your steps. My steps got almost like next to four hours in the day, but, you know, nailing it. And I was like, okay, right, yeah, I'm definitely not lean enough anywhere near this. <laughs> You know, yeah. so that was kind of the biggest thing. That's kind of how we kind of end up. And I've been following your social media from it. So, yeah, and that was it basically from that. Um, yeah, that's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I think, I'm kind of going on a tangent there. I think, I think, I think it's, it's interesting you bring up like that, that thinking of like, oh yeah, I've been pretty lean before. Because it's good to have those outside set of eyes. I have that same thing for a coach. And I think it's, not only is it the fact that are you lean enough? Because got, I think girls tend to think that they have to lose way more weight than they need to, right? You, you yeah. One day one goes, oh, I've got to lose 80 kilos. I'm like, you're only 80 kilos. But yeah. as guys are like, two kilos and I'll be shredded. I'm like, you've got to lose 20. Yeah, so yeah. Like that, but there's also guys have this thing, and I, I find this with, with um, not so much with coaches that I train, but certainly with you know regular guys and girls, is that there's a certain barrier where they kind of go, I don't want to look skinny. And they, yeah. they misinterpret skinny and flat. So Often, if you're on your own, you can sit there and go, I'm looking a bit skinny. Maybe I should have a refeed. And sometimes that may be true. And sometimes, yeah. like, no, this is part of the process. Keep going. You're good. Look at your weights. You're still going, getting stronger. All these things kind of like come full circle. So like, what was that like? First off, what is it that generally made you? You said a little bit there, but what is it that made you decide that, okay, I need a coach to go through this rather than trying to like, I know a lot of coaches who maybe 
think, okay, I'm, I, I need to prove that I can do it to my, for myself to show that I can give it to my clients. I need to do, you know, maybe I can research this. And I suppose a lot of people, maybe not coaches, would look at this and go, well, easy is a coach. He knows what he's doing. Why should he have one? Yeah, it was just that extra accountability, isn't it? So that, you know, first of all, I didn't want to get to the end of it and absolutely mess this up. Like, I've never done it before. So I was like, I need someone that's actually got the experience of actually doing this with people, with people and himself. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a difficult one. It's, it's, it's more just to make sure that I don't fuck this up. I, did, I didn't really want to mess this up at all. Um, to just kind of show that I can actually do this. And it's like, it's things like, um, you know, getting to the tail end of it and you're looking in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I look good, but I didn't want to look in six months time and like, I wish I did something a bit different and got a better result. Mm. Hence why having like, I'm sending you pictures every week and you're like, right, no, we need to get a little bit leaner. I'm like, I think I'm lean. <laughs> like, no, 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 you are a bit leaner. And then you get to the photos and you're like, okay, yeah, that was definitely needed. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's kind of the biggest thing. Mm. Even though like, yes, okay, I might be a coach and I know what I'm doing, but you still need that level of accountability to get that better result that you know that extra like five ten percent to be like yeah okay this has gone from good to kind of great mm. is that emo- is that emotional side of it as well right like if when you think oh i think i am lean is it because you're lean by what you've done before and your mm. expectations or is it an element of i think i am lean because i'm kind of worried in the back end that i don't want to have to grind harder which is a normal thing to think but yeah. it's also something that we sometimes maybe need and sometimes it's actually an important experience to go through. Certainly as a, a coach, I think the ability to grind, maybe more than my clients have ever need to grind, is a valuable tool. Yeah, I wanted, that was one thing that I did want to get from this, was like, yeah, fair enough. Most clients don't want to get that lean, you know, to the point that they're feeling like crap, et cetera. But they, I wanted to kind of say like, hey, look, I can do this. I've done this. I can empathize with you so much more. You know, I understand what, you know, I don't want to use the word restriction, but I want to know what it's like when you're, you have to really think about what you're eating all the time. You have to make a conscious decision to go to the gym, even though you don't really fancy doing it. I want you know to kind of understand, like if I tell them what a step count is um, to go and do this, I know what it's like, you know, at the end of the day to go and do that <laughs> instead of just being like, yeah, go and do your calories. Because I think there's a lot of coaches that probably do not do what they're trying to say to their clients to do. And then when they don't do it, they're like, well, why aren't you doing it? It's like, well, get into the head, but you can't do that because you've never done it yourself. So, you know, yeah, I want to go to so far to the extreme that I can be like, no, no, I get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it, and you, if you don't, you've never done it before, you don't have strategies to use it as well, right? Like, I have about 10, 11 strategies that I can give a client who's struggling with their step count. I can also have the element of being able to put this into perspective. I had I had a client once who, who said to me, like, I gave him a, a target of 8,000 steps. And he went, oh, that's like about 12 hours of walking. I'm like, dude, there's one <laughs> hour of walking. Like, And it, when when you're the people who are just so used to sitting down and being like sedentary aren't really aware of how much of a time commitment that is. And you'd be able to say, no, no, it's it's, it's an hour. And you can yeah. do this in you know as many five-minute blocks you like or one-hour walk, I don't mind. All of a sudden takes that sort of overwhelming nature out of it. And yeah. like, okay, what, what can you do? I remember I had a client recently as well. It was like, no, I just can't do the steps. Is it really necessary I do the steps? I'm like, well, no, but the diet will probably be a bit harder. I was like, well, you're saying you have no time to do the steps. Okay. So how do you get to work today? I drive. Okay. And where'd you park? In the car park. Okay. Is there a car park a little bit further away? Yeah. Okay. Could you do that? Yeah. So mm-hmm. there you go. You've, you've gained 10 minutes of walking each way. That's, you know, you, that's 2,000 steps right there. You know, when you're at your office, what do you do? Do you sit at your desk? Yeah, all day. Do you answer emails? Yeah. Do you have emails on your phone? Yeah. Could you walk around answering emails on your phone 10 minutes every hour? Fantastic. You've just achieved 8,000 steps. Yeah. It's little things like that make such a big difference. It's like, even like, instead of taking the escalators, go up the stairs. Well, there's an elevator, take the stairs. You know, <laughs> little things like that. And 100%, it, it made it more aware of how long these sort of things kind of take, the kind of the mentality of it to get into like, I think I kind of talked about it in my stories a few weeks ago and it was like, you know, I did not want to do my steps one night. You know, I'd worked from six in the morning until nine o'clock at night and I saw like four or five steps. And I was like sitting there like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> but you know what I mean? So at least I kind of kind of empathize. No, no, I get that. And it was just me because I was unorganized, bottom line. Like, it was my fault. I'm not blaming anyone else. It was my fault for being unorganized. But it's kind of been like that. So if a client turns around to me, it's like, oh, it's nine o'clock at night. I couldn't get my steps. And it's like, okay, well, fair enough. I get that. It's happened to me before. End up doing it. But what's, how are you going to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Yeah. You know, and then we can come up with strategies because I fully understand it. And that was the biggest thing I kind of wanted from it. And as well to be like, hey, look, you know, I can actually do this myself. 
what's the importance you feel then of because that step uh, thing is a really important thing because you said like you didn't want to do it and i know from watching the video you did you went and did them and you went yeah. late in the day and obviously it wasn't an ideal situation but you got it done because you had a goal you had a deadline you had accountability mm. so what what do you think is the importance truly of taking ownership because i think a lot of times when when you people start these journeys they know what they need to do they know they need to you know eat less calories know they need to move more but they almost don't they don't take true ownership that when they do when they as you said it's fine if you occasionally have your day under your steps it's like yes. what do you do to make sure that doesn't happen again but making mistakes is normal repeating that mistake is different so like, how is it that you managed to keep ownership of these things in the sense of like, you just didn't let that day where you sort of got lazy and you didn't do it become a pattern and yeah. you make those changes? The biggest thing is having a goal that actually matters to you. In fact, I'm, I've literally got a video that I'm going to post about this today. And it's the goal needs to be more than just, I want to lose weight. It's like, why do you want to lose weight? Do you know what I mean? And you get really, really, really emotional with it. And, you know, to the point it can get quite upsetting for people talking about it, why they need to care about it. For me personally, it was that big thing of it, this is my profession. I need to show people that I can do this myself. Don't get wrong. You don't need to be in great shape to be a great PT. But as I kind of spoke about earlier, just to go through it, to understand it. And this is the biggest thing. And I think most people that do a great transformation have that moment of like, I need to change. Not I want to. I need to change. That's the difference. You know, it's like something like, for example, you're putting a T-shirt on that used to fit you and you're like, crap, this doesn't fit me anymore. Or like, you know, the same if it's a girl, you put a dress on, this doesn't fit me anymore. Crap, this is, I need to change now. It's not a case of want to. Because let's be realistic. If I said to you right now, most people, if I click my fingers and give you a six pack, you're saying yes. You say, yeah, yeah. Okay, right, cool. So everyone, I'm not saying everyone wants a six pack in the sense of, you know, that's going to make everyone feel better about themselves. But people will not be overweight if they don't... <laughs> I'm going off a tangent here. How do you go, on? How do you explain on, this? It's, it, it's more about finding that big reason why. And that's, if you speak to anyone that has made a lifestyle change, it is finding that why first. And if you don't have it, chances are you will not make a big change. Mm. I really feel really strongly about that. I completely agree. And I think it's that you'll get the first five, 10 kilos off, right? And you see this all the yeah. time where people go from being, even if you do have a little bit of a why, if it's not a big driving force to push you further, mm. you find that people, when they're unhappy, they're trying to push themselves away from them. Every day they wake up, they look in the mirror, they're not happy. And they yeah. lose the first five, 10 kilos. And it gets a bit where they're, they're not really happy, but they're not unhappy anymore. And they yeah. just kind of get stuck there. And that's where that why is. And I always compare it to like going to work, right? Like I, I'm very lucky and I, I relatively enjoy what I do, you know, but like, like any job, there, there are bits that, you know, some days you wake up raring to go and some days you don't. But I think everyone listening to this can have that sense of feeling where they wake up on a, it's a Monday or Tuesday and go, oh, I've got to go into work today. It never feels yeah. as good as a Sunday. But I'm pretty much sure 90% of the people who listen to this still go into work. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because having money to buy things or to support their family or whatever you spend your money on is more important than that feeling of, I just want to stay in bed. Yeah. When it comes to fat loss, people don't expect the same thing. They expect this level of, well, I kind of want to be able to do everything I want to do. I want to find a sustainable approach that allows me to have pizza and donuts and beer and get shredded. And if I have to take this pill or take this supplement, I don't have to do any of the work. But you don't, no one does this with, with a job. People expect they have to go into work, but people don't <laughs> expect dieting to be relatively hard. Like what was, before we delve into that, because that's a big topic, and you, you know, why, because you, you, you found your why, but what is it that you felt was important of having a deadline? Because that photo shoot was a big thing looming over your head. Oh, it makes you, because you know you've only got, so when I came to you, I think I had six weeks, six, seven weeks, something like that. Seven weeks, yeah. So like, you know, you kind of said to me, like, by the way, you're going to need to wrap this up on like our initial conversation about, you know, the cardio and things like that. This is, you're going to, you kind of gave me an idea of what my weight was going to need to get down to, give me an idea of how much kind of I was going to have to do. And you look at it and you're like, shit, that's quite daunting. But when you've got six, seven weeks left, you're like, right, I'm laser focused on this. It's when it gets tough, you know, you've only got a couple of weeks left. Right. Like, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Because I don't want to get to these photos and end up being like, oh, why didn't I just do those extra couple thousand steps? Why don't I do that? Just that extra cardio session. But because you have that deadline, you're like, no, 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 this isn't forever. This is all good. I can I can do this. If I just tick this box, get it done, you know, go to bed, wake up the next day, tick those boxes again. And you know, it's not forever. So you're like, right. Okay. I'm going to keep going at it instead of thinking, am I going to have to be doing this for the next 
10, 20, 30 years of my life. That's scary. Yeah. Thinking and it that's, like and that. that's generally what people, a lot of people believe. They think, you know, they go into a diet and think what you're doing right now has to be forever. You know, yeah. in the same thing as in the similar thing as like people assume when they get abs, it's locked in. And if they gain any pounds of body fat, then, you know, that's it. They've, they've ruined what they're hard work. Like not entirely, you know, like understand that nothing, everything is cyclical and everything should be cyclical because being in a deficit long term isn't healthy mentally or physiologically. And can you really be sustainable in that? Like you've got to keep some habits, but if you, if you never feel you can have a beer without guilt, that's not sustainable. <laughs> No. And why would you want to do that? Yeah, ab- yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I totally agree with you in terms of like having that deadline makes it valuable. And I've seen this with myself and other clients. I, I find it easy to really diet hard. I, I know that when, you know, when I, I learn from both shoot preps and mini diets in mini diets is where I make the mistakes mm. because, and the difference, the sole difference there is that I don't have as strict a deadline. When I have that deadline, like a photo shoot, I don't make as many mistakes because I make sure, mm-hmm. which shows the importance of what you're saying of a deadline. But on the mini diets is where I kind of go, why am I not losing? Why have I stopped losing weight this week? And you realize you're dipping. Um, you know, the banner's falling off behind me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you, you know, you're, you're dipping your chicken in more sauce. You're guesstimating portion sizes more. You, you, you're, you're making, you, you know, when you load meals out, you're looking in your food dive for the most calorie friendly option so you can justify the spare ribs. Yeah. yeah. But I, don't, I don't do that when I've got the main, like a really, really, really strict goal. So I think that why is really important. Like, obviously you've done this with clients as well. Like, how do you begin to find somebody's why? How does someone begin to find someone's why? I, I don't, it's, you, how do, it's an interesting one because it's like sometimes they'll come in thinking that it's just because they want to lose a couple pounds or anything like that. And you really need to delve into it. It's like, so what it's like, right. If they say, for example, I want to lose 10 kilos. Like, why do you want to lose 10 kilos? And like, because I want to feel a wee bit more confident. Okay, we're getting there. Why do you want to feel more confident in yourself? And then they'll come up with a conversation like, you know what? I don't feel very attractive in myself. I don't feel good with my clothes off or anything like that. I don't think my partner finds me attractive. And you're like, great. I was like, why does that matter to you again? And then they come out with something else. And this is it. You just have to keep delving into it, digging, digging a wee bit deeper. And like I say, it can get quite emotional. But once you've got that, and then you start to kind of get into this, because fat loss is challenging, don't like 100%. Anyone says that it's easy or whatever, it's not. There's so many factors come into it. But when it comes into, it starts getting that bit challenging and you found that emotional big connection of it. You're like, no, 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 I want to do this because of this whole big, massive reason that I've delved into. And it is just a case of being completely honest with yourself, which is a level of honesty, which is horrible to kind of get with yourself sometimes. Mm. And this is, you know, where the fitness industry a wee bit kind of lets itself down because it's all about, you know, half of it, let's be realistic. They're selling sex all the time instead of selling instead of selling a complete lifestyle change to actually make yourself feel better about yourself. Because you shouldn't go through your whole life about, you know, hating yourself. And this is what we do as a job can be so satisfying when t- someone turns around to you and you're like, you know, I feel great about myself again. You know, I feel better at my work again. And that's the big thing that w- what we should be doing as PTs. You know, it's, yeah. it's not just about the abs and stuff. Don't get me wrong. Just doing a photo shoot is a bit hypocritical, right? <laughs> but it's not just about that. Yeah. I also think when, you, when you're looking at that, when you look at things like happiness, so without making this too philosophical. Yeah. No like, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> but a lot of the, the mar- and I get it, it's marketing, sex sells. And, you know, you might make it sound like someone's transformed their life and that the, the key to them getting, getting the happiest they've ever been in their life is getting a six pack. And I half agree and a half don't in the sense of, I think the thing, the lessons you learn from going through a fat loss transformation, learning how to delay gratification, learning how to work hard for something, learning how to create structure in your day has a big carryover to other things that can also make you very happy. And in terms of being able to do that, building confidence in the way you look has a big carryover into the way you present yourself to the world. So while that is absolutely true, I, I do think that happiness is a, is, is a much more complicated thing than if you look good, you're going to be happy. Like there's a broad spectrum of what makes people happy. And while there's an element of getting lean, that may be a good tick list, certainly for a dude to sort of like go, okay, I've done that. I've achieved that thing. That's a life goal that can give you a little bit of confidence. Most people don't want to stay there. No. And social media makes it out that, you know, you get there, you stay there. And that's where happiness lies. And, and in turn, that makes the, the post dieting phase much harder because you don't want to let go of this because you feel that this, this is the answer to your happiness. When in reality, like 
this these you'll probably find that somewhere in between where you started and where your best is is where you're going to spend most of your life but social media has killed us and thinking that we have to look shredded all year round and most of us don't want to live that life no. I, i'm a personal trainer and i don't want to live that life no exactly the same um like i said, I said earlier it was you know when someone asked me about my diet it was like at what point did you find this sustainable i was like afterwards <laughs> you know i don't want to live like that the whole year round it's a good thing to take the box of 100 percent. i wouldn't be able to say that i can do it or that i have done it but yeah it was cool it's an experience you know 100 percent um doing things for doing something for the experience is an okay reason to do it <laughs> you know because like you said you do learn a bit about it and everything and uh, there was habits that i've definitely gotten out of it that more so i am not i'll be completely put my hands up i'm not a big fan of walking i find it boring but I have actually started making more of a conscious effort walking places now because of it. So, you know, there's positives from it. Yes, okay, I'm definitely not wanting to go down to 1,600 calories anytime soon. <laughs> but, you know, there is definitely positives that I've got out of it. And just having that newfound respect of how doing difficult things again, you know, I haven't done something like that in a long time that's really kind of made a challenge that has been in the forefront of my head all the time. So having that challenge was a nice thing to kind of be doing again, mm. you know, and what's wrong with doing something just because you want a bit of a challenge, right? hundred percent. Well, people do this thing all the time with other things, right? But, it, but people get into this illusion that fat loss is somehow different. And mm. like, while it shouldn't feel for the majority of your time, it shouldn't feel horrendous. If you want to get to the extreme ends of where most people won't go and look like that, there's going to be a level of sacrifice and hard work that's going to come from it, you know? And, and, and you mentioned like you're not a fan of walking, but you take more time for it. I mean, what I presume going down to 1600 calories for a short period of time did for you is you found ways of managing hunger, managing food yeah. volume, things that now when you go back into your day to day life, you can make sure what, what would have been your normal calories of 4000, 5000 calories. You can probably bring that down just by keeping some of those habits without ever consciously thinking on oh, being restrictive here. Like, What were some of the lessons you learned being in the, the deeper part of the diet? Um, lessons kind of learned from that is. Time management is everything. You know, if you um, if you really kind of want something that's going to be quite difficult, get organized with it. Like, figure out ways to kind of make it fit into it. You know, things like, like you kind of just pointed out there, like food volume is such a big deal when it comes down to hunger. Like, at 1,600 calories, I will be honest, I actually wasn't too hungry with it. And I don't know because it was like, I think it was like four days before. We only did it for four days. Um, having that deadline again, having it, oh, yeah, this is fine. I can do this for four days. That's fine um but having that food volume thing of right okay how can i make this as easy as possible instead of like right what can i fit into 1600 calories which is just crap right how can i make this as easy as possible so it was just bulking foods out so again like you said now it comes into it right why am i hungry okay it's because my food it hits the calories but it's not hitting anything else mm. so and that's kind of something that i've kind of found that other people kind of do you give them a certain amount of calories and they're like i'm hungry so the first thing I kind of end up doing now is looking at it, it's like, right, what are you actually eating in these calories? And normally it's 16 or whatever the number is, 1,800, 2,000 calories of non-nutrient dense foods. It's a pizza. It's, you know, the, the, the breakfast is toast instead of a protein source and things like that. And you're like, right, well, instead of changing the calories, let's just actually change the food sources instead and see how you actually go with it. I think, that's, um, I think that's such a game changing thing when people realize it as well. And sometimes it's quite a hard thing to, in a way, convince people to do if they don't understand it. Because the go to thing when people look at cravings and when you look at social media again is how do I curb this craving? And there's always a, a protein and nut yeah. butter chocolate mousse that's about 500 calories, but don't worry, it will curb your cravings. And I'm like, okay, I'm not necessarily against these things, but this is a last resort thing. Mm. And in that in that chocolate mousse that was 500 calories, you could have got a whole plate's worth of food. And it, no one wants to hear that. Well, you know, Simon, I'm craving I'm craving chocolate. What can I have? Vegetables. No one <laughs> wants to hear that that answer. But I had a client recently started. It was um, he was he was a low low carb for life. Right? It was like carbs are the reason why I, I've gained body fat. I'm like, so at least on my initial strategy call, and you know this, we go through the diet, we make adjustments, we make it something oh, that yeah. do. He was like fighting. I was like, I got him down to 80 grams of carbs. That's like the most I could give him. There's absolutely no way. And now he's, he, you know, he, he doesn't, he's like, he's like, he literally sends me messages. You can't ignore the law of thermodynamics. 
And he's, you know, he's, he's talking every time he talks about voluminous foods and, you know, he's not, he said, he said he's not craving and he's full and all these good stuff. But he wouldn't have done that initially when he was trying to find keto cupcakes. <laughs> and, you know, and, and this is this thing that people do. They try and fit their cravings in. And sometimes, OK, let's look at the big rocks first. You know, are you hydrated? Are you sleeping enough? Are you actually like filling your food up to like the max amount of food you can? If then you're still craving something and you tick those boxes and you've got a bit of calories left, by all means, have a bit of something you enjoy. But if you try and go in with the sort of like that, that emotional head straight into dieting, like I can't give up my ex. Yeah. And that's the first thing you think about. You're setting yourself up for a harder diet. I think the point that you put on there as well about your hydration stuff, because it was about, again, it must be two, three weeks before it, uh, the photo shoot. And my, I was tired. I was getting really, really tired. I had about three, four PT sessions in a row. And um, for anyone that's not done PT sessions, I find it more mentally draining than doing hours of being a spark, like 100%. So being an electrician, I could do hours on end to be total fine. But doing like three, four hours back to back of PT, I'm like, this is really great because you can't switch off. Mm. Or like if you're, you know, doing your job properly, you shouldn't be switching off because you've got so much to worry about in a sense of like doing the exercise right. You know, the back position is okay, right? The foot position is okay. Is that load okay? Are they actually working hard? You know, you're really trying to, Giving that energy to make sure they're working intensely, right? Which gives yeah. energy from your half. What's they're coming in with? Are they coming in with, you know, things that have gone on in their life, you know, private yeah. life, personal life that, you know, they bring on to you in the same way. It's like a, imagine like if a therapist all of a sudden had to get up and like physically move somebody and make sure they give it energy and intensity. It's, it's, it's a challenging thing. It really is. Yeah, totally. And um, I remember messaging you being a bit like, right, this is happening. I've got three to four uh, PT sessions back to back. Feel crap. Is there anything that I can do to make this easier? And he was like, because obviously I was like, cancelling this isn't the issue, the option. You were like, no, 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 obviously don't do that. And he was like, first of all, check your hydration. And I was like, okay, right, yeah, that's a good idea. But he's like, but second of all, don't go into the mindset of that you're going to feel like shit. Like that's the first thing you should be doing realistically is going and being like this will be fine you're going to be good and those two things yeah the hydration thing 100% helped like I've actually started carrying a bottle of water with me again that's another good thing that I've come away from this I, I'm more conscious of my water intake now when I'm feeling a bit rubbish but the mindset thing was definitely a big one as well and uh, so I went into that saying to myself you know a few hours before I was like oh, it'll be fine I'm going to be all right I'm not going to be tired I'm not going to feel like crap I'm not going to you know just pass on this <laughs> you know and it did actually by the end of it I was like that was probably the easiest couple hours of PT that I've actually done in a long time mm. because of that. So, you know, that if you go into the situation when it comes to, again, going into like this dieting and you're like, I'm going to hate this. I'm not going to be able to enjoy what I'm eating. I'm going to not be able to socialize. Like this is going to be like, make my life really, really boring. And I'm going to become a boring person. Chances are it is going to be all those things. Mm. But if you go in with a positive attitude towards this, it's like, no, no, I'm actually going to like what I eat. No, no, I'm actually going to enjoy training. No, I'm actually going to become a better person from this. And it's going to be a good experience. Then it will be. Hmm. So it's just that little thing. Like I will completely admit that, especially when I was younger, I thought all that mindset sort of stuff was complete nonsense. But the older I get now, I'm like, no, that really does make such a difference to the situations you go in and the outcome of it as well. But we, we all know, we all know that time where, you know, when you're 17, 18, you go on a night out, right? And you go on a night out and you can't be bothered, you're tired, you don't know anyone, you think it's going to be a rubbish night. It always is a rubbish night. But yeah. when you go in thinking, I can't wait for this night out, I'm going to meet some new people, it's always a good night because you put yourself out there. And it's the same thing when it comes to dieting. And it's the same thing with hunger, right? Like, hunger's a big one because a lot of times it's like, I see people trying to do everything in their power to avoid hunger. Everything. But you want to diet. At some point, you're going to feel hungry. And, and, I think it's condition. We are conditioned to believe that every time we're hungry, because we we've got everything in the fridge now. We've got shops. We've got delivery. Anytime I feel a momentary bit of hunger, I can eat something, mm. and that's the first time in history that really that's been the case. Like to to this degree, like since delivery and things like this, we have no reason why we ever need to be hungry ever again. And sometimes it's okay to go. Yeah, okay, I'm hungry. Great. Good for you. Like <laughs> hit with it. Like it goes away. You know, it, 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 hunger is an emotion. Like, no, don't be wrong. Ravenously hungry, your body is telling you something. You know, if you're really, really, really hungry, like constantly, problem, red flag. Mm -hmm. But a little bit hungry every now and again, especially when you're on a diet, is an emotion. It's like happiness. Like you're never going to be happy all your life and you're never going to be sad and depressed all your life. 
it will go, it will pass, sit with it. And you'll be fine that so half of it is, it's more habitual hunger. Oh, I'm a little hungry, I grab something, than it is actual true hunger. I don't want to go into that whole drink some water and you won't be hungry again. It's a go-to thing. But it's, I generally think it's more habitual hunger. And people, and it, it spins off in different things. And the longer I've been a coach, I noticed these things. Like you were saying here, I'm hungry. I don't want to sit with it. This is the same, same problem is when someone goes, can I have um, 474 recipes for the next week, please? I'm like, good luck. This is you trying to think, you're going in with the diet with the mindset, my food's going to suck. So I need to do something immediately to make sure it doesn't suck. So I'm now going to take on more than I can chew, trying to cook all these extravagant meals. And it's just keep it simple. You're going to, you're going to burn out completely. And you mentioned, you know, structure earlier on in terms of structure, in terms of keeping the diet simple, what have you learned? So yeah, when it comes to that, people seem to think when they go on a diet, trying to lose body fat, that they need to start eating like gourmet meals and they need to be cooking everything and everything needs to be different. But realistically right now, most people's diets just in general, they eat the same things, breakfast, lunch, dinner, their snacks are quite similar as well. And instead of seeing that as a good thing, when it comes to diet and they want everything different, like they want to have, you know, about 10 different breakfasts, 10 different lunches, 10 different dinners, 10 different snacks. And it's like, well, why not find a healthier breakfast that you actually like and have a couple variations of it? As in like, so for example, for me, I'll have a protein shake. And once that protein powder is done, I'll get a different flavor. And that's almost enough to keep it interesting. What about my lunch? Okay, I like chicken sausages, so I'll batch cook them. And what I'm going to change is have fins, you know, instead of bagel fins or little things like that that keep it interesting. I'm going to change the salad that I put on it or I'm going to change the bit of sauce I'm going to have at dinner. Okay, dinner's a wee bit different. I use like HelloFresh sort of thing because it's easy. I don't need to think about it. It helps with me and the girlfriend as well because we don't need to continue text, oh, what suits you, what suits me? It's like, this is what it is. At the moment, we're both calorie counting. Um, so it's in my fitness pal. We don't need to worry about it. It's like, oh, by the way, does this help with you? Does this help with me? You, you know, there's none of that. So that makes yeah. it easy. And then again with the snacks, so I'm into sweets. So like, I'll just rotate them differently, you know, like from fruit pastels to wine gums, things like that. So the biggest thing as well is to not look, don't go into it thinking you're going to need to be cooking mental meals that need loads of different ingredients. Find things that you actually kind of like and keep it simple. Hmm. Like, don't, don't think that, that health is just cooking fancy meals because it's not i think i think rotate like I, I think what the key thing you mentioned there is well which is good it's like finding something that you can cook really simply keep the meals relatively the same so you have a element mm. structure and rotate the accessories so like i i, I remember when i i you know in, in hong kong without ovens but i remember when i was in the uk and i had a big oven to do my food prep i have like eight chicken breasts and each two will be spiced differently the meal is exactly the same but every day my two chicken breasts taste a little bit different. So, mm. you know, one, one would be sort of like spicy paprika, and then one would be herby. You know, the, maybe the other one would have a low calorie sauce on it I adjusted for. And when I went out for snacks, I had a couple of days where I was like, okay, if I'm going to go out for some food, I know that I can go to R&R bagels and I smoke salmon bagel. Or if I want to fit in a frozen yogurt, it's this many calories. And now I know what the day is going to be to work around option A or option B. Mm. And because of that, my diet was very, very simple. Things I cook, I had to, I bang on a lot. And you probably heard me in the group talk about the low fat bacon medallions from MS. Two minutes in a pan, I don't need to put anything on them, just taste like bacon. I can still have a bacon sandwich. Like, rather than trying to make it complicated and trying to go, what's a what's a low carb spaghetti bolognese recipe with courgette spaghetti? I can't be bothered with that. I had clients ask for recipes and like, you don't want my recipes because I am so simplistic with my cooking that you know most of them i don't even cook at all it's like okay what's pre-cooked what can i grab i can just open the packet and eat well this i remember when i first started pt and i was actually quite stressed about this because i was just like no one's gonna want to eat how i eat like i'm so boring with it like i don't care for cooking i'm very much i want to put something in the oven eat and done and yeah, okay fair enough it might not be very relatable relatable for people because i know i've got a couple of friends that are so foodie that like they're netflix you want to it and all it is is the food channel stuff right so i remember thinking like oh i'm gonna need to get recipe books i'm gonna need to do all this and everything like that but realistically nine times out of ten people don't have time to cook like that anyway they want simple things they want to be able to like cook something have it nice or have a quick option and go into like 
I don't know, m and and getting a quick sandwich or something like that and just know the calories in it. Because people have a real funny thing about that sort of thing as well, that like, I can't go in and get a quick option. There's no good options anywhere. And I'm really, I'm, I think I'm blowing my clients to death with it. Being like, no, there is an option everywhere. You just need to look for it. You need how, to start going into them. How much do you think that's down to the fact that a lot of people have demonized certain foods? So I had a client yeah. recently who, who was like, oh, the only thing I have is a sandwich. Expecting me to tell her off having a sandwich. I'm like, well, <laughs> what was in the sandwich? It's like, uh, chicken. Like, okay, cool. How much chicken do you reckon? Probably half a breast. Okay. Any, any, any particular th- like sauce or stuff on it? No. Yeah, it's not that bad. And people assume that bread is bad or, you know, insert food here is terrible. And this, yeah. this mentality around good foods and bad foods is the reason why they can't go in and buy themselves a sandwich because that's now an off, off limits food. When in reality, it's 250 calories. Yeah. Well, this is the thing as well, because that's such an easy one. Coming from a tradesman background, I know most people have a sandwich of some sort, mm. right? On site. And if they're going wanting to lose weight, the easiest thing they could do is go from just having, you know, it's obviously two pieces of bread. Why not just go and get fins? So mm. like a bit of bread is what off the top of my head, about 130 calories. So 260, a fin in a total is 100. You've loaded your calories pretty easily without doing much. You don't even need to cut the slices. You know, the fin, yeah. sorry. Do you know what I mean? They come pre-cut. Yeah. So there's no barrier there. It's just a case of buying one thing for another. And it's such a simple swap can make such a difference. And you're also not getting that awkwardness of being like, oh, you're on a diet or, or what, what are you doing? Eating weird, you know, because you're not. Because it's just the sandwich again. You can fill it up the same way. On, on that topic, and this is something I wanted to speak to you about in terms of, re- I'm going to go into social occasions in a second. This sort of ties into that as well to a degree. What do you think the importance of being able to say no is when dieting? Because I think it's something that, that holds a lot of people back from the goals mm. and I feel like they have to stick to social norms or, or that mentality of people thinking it's amazing. If someone has a pizza, no one questions. But if you have a salad, why are you eating weird? Yeah. They're like, what's your take on this? Is there any points in time where you've had to say no during this diet? And how was that? So I'm, I'm quite fortunate that the people around me that are very, very into the, not very into the gym, but you know, they're all kind of active, they get it and they know what I'm about as a person. Now, if I say no, they can't push me into doing it, hmm. right? It's just how it is. Um, but there was a couple of social occasions leading up to the photo shoot itself. I went, for a, I went for a tie with a couple of friends and I also went to a gig with the messes where we went again for sort of, I don't know why we did, it was just again, it was Thai food. So <laughs> it was quite easy to kind of be like with them, like I just had a couple of gin and tonics. They were on cocktails and stuff like that. And they didn't bat an eyelid because they were just like, okay, that's what you want. And I just didn't make a big fuss of it. I wasn't talking about it like, oh, by the way, I'm doing this, this, the other. So no, I just want a gin. It's what I want. And that's what I'm going to have. Do you know what I mean? Or it was the same again if like um, I got in, we had family round again and I got in Bud Lights, by the way, from beer, mm. which sucked, by the way. <laughs> They're awful. There's better, there's better low calorie beers. Than- 100%. It was the only thing in the shop, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have this. And it's like, it's almost just being so sure. Like, you know what? No, this is what I want to do now. And this is how I want to do it. And just have an honest conversation with people around you, mm-hmm. you know, as well. And just don't make a big deal of it. Don't just keep, don't keep bringing it back up. Just be like, no, this is what I want. And this is okay right now. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my biggest advice. People around you have honest conversations with them to how much it kind of means to you as well going off the bat like your other half if you're going out with them uh just tell them like look i want to kind of do this before we go out by the way mm. and then just don't make a big deal out of it you know it's easier said than done but it goes back to that why thing as well because then it means something to you to kind of go into that situation and maybe try better than go off the rails with it if that makes sense 100 i think i think there's many levels to this when it comes to the ability to say no i think it's important to, to be aware of what you're feeling in that moment where you're struggling to say no. Because for some people, I, I, it's that they don't want to tell their friends they're dieting in case if they fail and if they crack and they say yes to all these things on a regular basis, no one's going to hold them accountable to it. And I think sometimes it's like that holds them back because their friends are going to, in turn, that mentality allows them to peer pressure more because your friends aren't aware that this is a problem. And having that conversation, like, hey guys, I'm dieting. And going back to that why, this is why I'm dieting. I hope you understand. This is something for me. It's not forever. Those, those friends might actually just go, okay, I'm not going to offer you a drink. Hey, do we, would you like a you know, lime and soda? Yeah. But if you never told them, they have no reason not to hand you a beer. And I think there's the elements of that. 
But I think there's also that element of like when you're looking at like like saying no, it's like you said, it's being able to zoom out and go right. I think I'm gonna. It's fear of missing out. I think if I don't have this extra drink, everyone's gonna get really drunk, and I, everyone's gonna have a really great night, and I'm gonna, you know, miss out on it. But in reality, if we zoom out, we're gonna go. Okay, we're gonna feel like crap tomorrow. We're probably gonna eat badly. We're probably not gonna get to our goals. The bigger picture stuff that the why we spoke about, you know, is, is gonna be harder to achieve. So actually, for that sake of that one night, we actually are you know, impacting a much bigger part of our lives. But also, I ask you a question. So. Um, 10 years ago, tell me about one Saturday night out you had. Not a birthday, not an occasion, not a big one, just a random Saturday night out. Yeah. Tell me about one in detail. That's a good question. You can't do it, can you? No. <laughs> and, and, and people fear missing out for a night yeah. you probably won't even remember in six months' time. And it's sort of like taking the thing, it's like, okay, when you realize that, it's like, I need to learn how to prioritize here. Like you say about yourself when it comes to social occasions for yourself, you had a holiday, which had to take priority. I'm never going to say that you can't have anything you enjoy when you're on holiday. So because of that, you probably had to be smarter on the gig. And that's yeah. what we did. So it's that, that case of like, when you know that, it's like, okay, okay. When you, I know that not every night out is going to be the world ending, amazing night out that I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. It's like anniversaries, birthdays, you know, holidays. These are the things we need to maybe make, you know, maintenance days, refeeds, you know buffers for but maybe the other days it's okay to say no when it's just saturday night with the family yeah my thing with that as well though is that i've always kind of found this a bit odd that people can't have a good time without alcohol okay mm. i find this really kind of strange because you're like right you're, you're with your friends and you're saying you're only going to have fun if you drink or if you eat loads and loads of food what there's a wee bit of something that I've never sat well with me with that. Yeah. Like, I've gone to the pub sober, and uh, I've not said anything to anyone. And I remember I jumped in my car, and one of my friends was like, well, you're not drinking tonight? And I was like, no. And it, was like, it was like you were not You were drinking, though. It's like, well, yeah, I'm still going to have conversation with you. I'm mm. still going to have fun. I'm still going to have chat with you. But people seem to think if they, have a, if they don't have a drink, they have to be boring. Yes. And I understand there is an element of, like, maybe they're a wee bit shy or whatever like that. But... Bear in mind, if you're with your friends and it's a night out, why does the drink have to make it? Yeah, <laughs> you know, hundred percent, hundred percent. And it, it, I've, I've, I mean, I've been dieting and I have been sober. I've had sober, like in Hong Kong, we have these things called junk boats, or big, big party boat things. Oh yeah, I've been on one for yeah. I've been a couple of them uh, sober during my last uh, shoot, and I had better times. Yeah. I didn't feel like death. I didn't, I didn't, I felt less seasick as a result. You know, like, <laughs> I just, I just, I, I, I generally could enjoy it for what I meant to enjoy it. And I got up on a Sunday and I really enjoyed having a Sunday and I could still go and train and I felt good. And like there was, I, I realized there's more to life than a night out. Yeah. Well, this is it. And I, all of my life. Yeah. I mean, I remember this is years ago. I was in uh, Hong Kong and I went on a jump boat and uh, it was a bit of a crap experience to be honest. I was basically, um, it was overcast. Oh, and uh, I, so I was like, I don't need sun cream, I'll be fine. And uh, you know, however I was around came off that and I was just like, I am so burnt. This is this is awful. <laughs> well, Hong Kong's terrible for it. The first time I went here, uh, we went to an island called Lama Island, and um we, we put factor 50 on, but we must have just washed off and we hadn't really reapplied it. And I, I was the day England played Tonga in the first game of the World Cup, rugby world cup last in Japan, and I scratched my head, I went, Well, oh, that hurts. And I realized from the top of my head to the back of my knee, I was completely similar. Like my whole back peeled. <sighs> like I still have, if you can't see it's an audio quality, but all these freckles on the back of my neck, they weren't all there. Prior no. <laughs> really bad, like horrendous. Like, so I'm much more careful than I used to be. Um, but yeah, you, like, it, it, you hit the nail on the head with that feeling of, you know, like you, you need to drink to have a night, a night out. But if these are your friends, you shouldn't be. And if, if any friend's going to genuinely, genuinely judge you, for doing something that's important to them, hmm. th that's where the conversation of do you, are those people the people you want around you. I'm never going to be one to be ditching a friend, but I do think that that's the thing. But I think one thing we haven't mentioned as well is like, as much as we are talking about the importance of saying no, I do think it's a duty to be inclusive with some watch level of social occasions. You can't be a social recluse. This is where the no. sentiment thing changes. And I, and I, but I think there are systems in place that make 
how do you fit into how do you fit the dieting into social norms so you have to do the minimal amount of saying no so picking a lime and soda in between a gin and tonic or switching to low calorie mixes all those advice but also little things like one of the biggest things when people track calories is the biggest friction point is that they don't want to be that person going out to dinner with their friends and cracking open my fitness pal or cracking open an app all right this is solved with a bit of pre-planning if on if you're going out friday night if thursday night you open up your app you look at the menu where you're going to go you work out your best options you work out the rest of the day you put it in thursday night on friday you don't need to open the app again you just need to do what you said you were going to do eat the choices you made to go to the deadline or the limit of drinks that you'd set and you then all of a sudden can be a bit more guilt-free a bit more relaxed on that night out because you've already planned for it you know what you can allow and you can not have to be that person that feels like the diet and answers questions when they bring out the phone. Um, and I think systems like that, I think are really underappreciated in that people think they can just sort of wing it and hope that it all just works out in the end. And I just, I think structure is, is probably one of the most underestimated facts of dieting. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, no, hundred percent. So going back to, again, I had that uh, gig while I was uh, dieting and we went to that restaurant, how I managed it. I looked at the menu beforehand. And I was like, right, what's going to be on this that is going to make easiest to keep uh, on track? And it was a prawn dish with crab and noodles. So what I did, I just found, you know, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. It was like 150 grams of prawns, um, crab. I found that on my fitness pal. And I put in extra on each one and the noodles nest as well. And I put extra on each one just for arguments and just the cooking sauces, things like that. I then found out, right, what can I get from drinks there? Right, they have this sort of gin, this has a sort of tonic. Put a couple of them into that as well. Right, at the gig, where do they, at the SSE Armadillo, what do they actually serve there? Right, there's a couple of drinks there. I'm going to put that in that as well and structure the rest of my day around that. So I can still, you know, not ruin this for my partner as well and not be that awkward person because that's one big thing I think people kind of think, like, oh, am I going to ruin this for everyone else by being boring? So I was an element of like, no, I don't want to be that guy. So I'm going to make sure I'm not that guy mm. by this is the priority on Saturday night and I'll make it work around that for her, you know, or not just for her, for me as well, I'm going to have a good night as well. And uh, so that's basically how I did it. And that's how I kind of, when people come to me like clients and they're like, right, I've got this on Saturday. I was like, okay, how are we going to plan for this? You know, what's the food situation? Have you checked the menu? No, start there. Right. Go and decide, go and screenshot the menu, send it to me and decide what you're going to want. And I'll have a look around and we'll be like, yeah, cool, sure, do that like you know start planning things because people seem to think that fat loss is just going to happen and without this extra bit of work on weekends it's like yeah monday to friday i am on it this is great and then i'm going to get to the weekend so, oh well, i've done monday to friday awesomely so let's just relax the weekend no 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 no. like this needs to be a wee bit of a lifestyle change completely and you need to still put the effort on the weekends you know and I, and it sucks like it does it, it can be frustrating especially to begin with to kind of start doing this but once you get into the routine of it you're going to start getting these habits okay i'm doing this on saturday night so how can i make this work and mm -hmm. that's what you're trying to do because if you don't put a bit of effort in like i feel like some people are afraid to kind of say you're going to need to put a bit of effort into this you know if you don't do that then you're going to fail like 100 percent. you know you can be so holistic if you want with everything but there has to come a point where it's like well you need to have a bit of effort to make you get you to get you to your goal unfortunately yeah absolutely <laughs> it's a problem i have was in the way with people who call themselves holistic health coaches like in everyone should be an holistic health coach and managing stress and health and recovery and everything like this but often like this these these are spawned by people that want to not want to work hard and think mm -hmm. that anyone pushing calories even slightly low is 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 destroying their clients metabolisms like like did you know the day when you're on 2000 calories the day we took you to 16 your thyroid just just said nope <laughs> like, it, doesn't work that way, right? it doesn't work that way and this, this that's even assuming the fact that most people tracking is accurate right so someone that thinks they're on 1500 calories could actually be on 2400 because the tracking is inaccurate and i think mm. the people having attention to detail on their tracking during the week tend to be the ones that manage nights out much more efficiently because they go well it was that beer that made me gain fat no it wasn't it was all the cookies you didn't track and the chips off your partner's plate and the oils and the sauces and the lattes yeah. There was just the tip of the iceberg here with this lack of attention to detail. And then you take that lack of attention to detail and put it to an environment where there's now no structure. And, and these things sort of entirely go out the window. And there's got to be that level of, again, it comes back to sort of taking ownership. People wouldn't expect this with their finances. You wouldn't go, oh, well, I'm going to say, I want to save some money this month. 
So I'm going to save money through Friday and I'm going to buy four Rolexes on Saturday and Sunday. Or I'm going to go to Ibiza every weekend. You, you wouldn't expect to save money, but people take this approach with dieting all the time. And it, the, the saving analogy, I think, is one that what we're hits home with a lot of people because it's like, you know, if you want to buy a Rolex or go to Ibiza every weekend, that's you can do it and save money. But you've got to understand that you're probably going to be living off like cheap, unbranded tin baked beans every meal for the, for the week and not spending anything, not getting any other things during the week, not paying for toilet transport, walking everywhere. And, and you, you come to understand that. Oh, OK, it's a sacrifice. So I want to go away. But you, people don't do that same thing with dieting. They think, oh, well, if I'm good back in, you know, during the week, I can be extravagant on the weekends. And like, well, you blow you, you completely blow your deficit. And that level of fall planning becomes so important there. And I think sometimes as well, it also takes away the guilt with it. I call it the Snickers bar analogy. If I said to you, you can't have a Snickers bar, Jack, you're going to go, oh, fucking hell, I want a Snickers bar. Thanks, Simon. Whereas if you kind of go, a Snickers bar is 300, you know, 420 calories odd, right? Okay. If I have that, that means I have this much less food. Is it worth being that little bit hungry? If yes, you're going to have to sit with that hunger like we spoke about earlier on. And you have to be okay with that because you made the choice. But if you go, oh, man, it's just not worth it. You don't have that feeling deprived feeling anymore because you made the choice. Yeah. And I think that's where the weekends come in. So you want a big weekend, fine, but you're going to have to work really hard in the week. Oh, I've got a bit of a funny story from that going on about like having like that Snickers. So I went into Tim Hortons. Tim Hortons opened up in Starlight. I've been a wee bit borderline obsessed with it, right? Hmm. So going, I had a black coffee and I was looking at the donuts and they had the calories in them. And I was like, okay, great. Let's have a look at this. Now, one of them said about 200. And I was like, that's 200. And it was like this big chocolate brownie sort of thing. In the back of my head, I was just like, I'm not so sure. Ordered it anyway and uh, had it. And I was like to Kim, I was like, this can't be 200. I'm checking their website. It, it was triple. It was about... 400 close to 600 mm. right and i was just like shit my calories are completely ruined for the today that wasn't worth it do you know what i mean that was not worth it and there was this element of like well i'm about i'm like a few weeks out of this like i'm gonna have to just suck this up i'm mm. just gonna have to suck this hunger up now you know i had the rest of my day planned out i'm having this yeah. for dinner this for that and i was just sitting there like nah i can't deal with this this is this is stressful now um, but there was an element of, well, that was my choice. I've done it. I've eaten it. I'm going to have to just suck this hunger up for the rest of the day till dinner time. Do you know what I mean? Mm. The fortunate thing was that we went to the cinema. So we went there to the cinema. So there was like a couple hours just sitting, watching a film, being distracted. So there was distraction being hunger, yeah. uh, being hungry. But yeah, there is an element. It's like, is this worth it? Because that's a meal in just a donut. Do yeah. you know what I mean? And if I had known that before, I, bet I wouldn't have had that. That's not, the trade-off isn't worth it. The trade-off of being hungry for the rest of the day isn't worth it. But it is what it is. I had to sit for it and it got for it and it was fine. But yeah, you start to kind of look at things like, if you're allowed it, you then start thinking, is this worth it? Yeah. <laughs> it's, and it's being aware as well. You had the foresight and the look of this, of like, I'm looking, this is a learning opportunity. I want to learn more about my calories. So I'm going to go away and like, I don't think this is 200 calories. I'm going to check this. And because you checked it, you realize it wasn't. But a lot of people would go into this again with a sustainability mindset inside. Like, oh, well, I can just have a donut because I want it. And I, well, it's good for my mindset to have a bit of what I enjoy. And mm. they would see this as 200 calories and they wouldn't even think to check it because they're like jackpot. And yeah. it's that taking ownership of your results again. It's coming back to that same point of like, if you really want the result more than you want that donut, if you're if something seems too good to be true, check. Because this is where this is where the, the battle it's not won and lost. I want to make it sound like people can't have ever have a donut and not lose weight, but just just that sort of that little thing of like chefs and restaurants and shops are not there to make it calorie friendly for you. They're there to make it taste good. It's your job to go and make sure that, that fits what your goals are of that time. Fat loss, building tissues, maintenance, whatever your goal is, your job to make sure that works. So like being able to go and go, okay. And that takes education. You were a bit further down the line starting because you're a coach yourself and you've done this before and you've gotten lean. But if you're new to this, like having getting sending food pictures across to somewhere, coach a friend or someone in the know and go, does this look about right? This is what I've tracked it. You know, like the more accurate you can be with that, as I said earlier on, the easier the rest of this diet becomes. Because if every single meal that you think is 400 calories is six, 700, you're not going to have room on a Saturday night for no. a 
Whereas if you did, if every meal was bang on 400, you might be able to fit in that donut on a weekend relatively easily. Yeah, well, this is it. I mean, if I was a wee bit more, pl- because I thought it was this, it just completely knocked off my whole day. Yeah. And uh, because I was sitting there like, oh my God, this sucks. But at the same time, it was my decision to eat it. So I'm taking ownership from it. I am not going to sit there and be like, oh, this sucks. So I ended up eating way over my calories. I was like, well, no, I've done it. It's my decision to eat it regardless. I need to take responsibility for this and just crack on, right? A bit of hunger is not going to kill me, such as life. Do you know what I mean? Massive first world problems that like, you know, I can't go in there and have another meal or whatever like that. You know, I've chosen to restrict my food as well to, as a, I've chosen to restrict my food as well. So a bit like, well, it's like, oh, you know. It's interesting you mentioned that you almost like you you alluded to the fuck it button there. Mm. I think it's a really weird, (laughs) like, Again, not necessarily calling anyone out, but the biggest bottleneck to results for personal trainers is the client. Yeah. Right? It's not the plan. It's not this. It's the client. The clients that don't get results don't communicate. Hit the fucker button. You know, and again, this is, this is our job to help you with these. And you know, so, so but I never really under, like, I found strategies to help people with it, but I've never really understood the fucker button. You would never get this in any other hobby or any other walk of life. When you're learning Spanish, and maybe you get a word wrong. You don't go, fuck it. I'm never going to read Spanish again. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're trying to save money, you wouldn't go, oh, man, that was a pound more than I thought. Fuck it. I'm going to Ibiza. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, don't, I don't get where this mindset comes in with dieting where, oh, it's 50 calories over. Ha, huh, well, it's ruined till Monday. Yeah. And I, 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 get, I think it all comes back to that why. Because someone with a why doesn't do that. No. Someone... Someone that wanted to do that in the first place, they're already looking for an excuse to hit the fucking button before that button is hit. I think. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the analogy of, like, if you get a puncture in your car, uh, does it make sense to go and puncture the other three wheels? No. <laughs> Just don't make the situation worse. Think to yourself, like, right, how can I make this better? How can I stay on track? How can I, you know, maybe make sure that it doesn't happen again? Mm. You know, if I'm in that situation, again, can I make it better? You know, and it's like, it's almost a borderline like, oh, well, I've done that now. What's the point? This is it. It's over. And it, like I say, it's, it's a very emotional thing. We need to sometimes, yes, understand the emotion, but sometimes take the emotional decision out of it and start thinking logically, which is easier said than done. We're saying all this like it's so simple, but it's not. Um, because we are emotional pe- uh, creatures as, as opposed to like logical. So, but it is getting to that point where like, right, let's just make sure this doesn't happen again. Or what can we take from it? And so when it's in a couple of weeks time, because you are everyone's fat loss journey isn't just like, right, let's start and you're gonna go down, 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 down fat loss. Or you know, it's never straightforward. There's always bumps. And I think it's great. When a client comes to me with a problem and say, This this happened, I'm not sitting there like, oh well, you're awful, you're the worst person in the world. I'm like, great, this is a learning opportunity of a sense of let's make sure this doesn't happen again. <laughs> you know, what can you take from it? Yeah, my biggest frustration working with clients is the op- I would rather a client come to me every single week with a problem that they're struggling with. And I would look and go, I'm so glad you're talking to me about the problems because now I have an opportunity yes. to help you with these problems. And often, so true. nine times out of 10, they're really simple. Like <laughs> I found a client having a thousand calories worth of sauce on something when we looked at these pictures, right? Okay, let's switch to a low calorie source. Boom, weight goes down. Client that's struggling with hunger. What's your lunch? Um, just a piece of ham. Cool. Could you have some vegetables? Yeah. No hungry anymore. Simon, I've got four PT sessions back to back and I'm feeling really tired. Are you drinking enough water? Probably not. Done. And but the, the problem often comes, and this is a list to anyone that's clients out there, you know, especially if any of my clients listen out there, this is a big lit thing for you guys, right? It's often easier than you think your problem to solve. And the, one of the biggest frustrations is when you see those things that are really easy to fix, that client doesn't mention it, hides from you, doesn't check in doesn't respond to your messages and then just disappears off or gains a bunch of weight because they couldn't overcome that problem on their own. I'm like, you paid for coaching. Let coaching happen. Yeah. Often people think that when they pay for coaching, that's it. Their problems are solved. Six packs achieved. I'm like, no, I need to help this. I need to be able to coach. I can't coach. I can't mind read. If you, if I, if you want me to coach, let me coach. I think to get that, I kind of say this to every client when I onboard them. It's like, you're going to get the most out of this if you communicate. You're going to get the most out of this if you tell me not just your wins. But I want to know when things are going 
badly. Mm. Like, because something's going to happen. Like, <clears throat> something will. And if you don't tell me about it and you just completely ghost, I can't help. And that's the whole bloody point of this is that you're in a situation where you need help right now, but you need to be open to actually receiving it as well, as, as weird as that sounds. Yes. Um, like you need to put yourself in a position where you're quite honest, which is, I think the vulnerability comes into it. Like people don't want to be judged. And this is where our job is of being like empathetic. Again, going back to doing the photo shoot stuff is to empathize with it. Yeah, it does suck. Like these stories of, you know, having a donut and like shit. I was way more or eating out and getting it you know and it's clients need to kind of understand that like okay no right okay he wants to help me I'm like what's it do you know I want to get you the result you want <laughs> yeah exactly and it, before before we jumped on air we, we had to look through my my brand new check-in system that's going to happen yes. and a lot of the questions that I put on there <clears throat> are to be able to make people aware like do you know what it's okay if you have a maintenance day it's okay if you're struggling with this it's okay if you kind of want to break from dieting like i'd rather you communicate that to me than not and those check-ins where you're struggling are the check-ins that are most important because the check-ins where everything's going well i'm like good work jack Keep going. <laughs> fantastic but it's often how often do you see this with a check-in where you've got a client that hasn't checked in that week and you chase them and go, hey yeah all okay i haven't received a check-in yeah yeah wasn't a good week so i didn't think i need to check in no, no, no. This is the week where you need to check in. Because yeah, if you sure. only check in when it's good, I only see the good stuff, which means when there's a problem, I can help you with the problem. Because I've only got data from the good things. And you see it all the time where clients gain loads of weight and they go, they feel demotivated. You know, what can I what kind of do? Why am I not losing weight? And you go on to it and you go, well, you stopped tracking on Thursday and it's now Tuesday for the last four weeks. And it's, it's not, the problem isn't that you overate on the weekends. The problem is that you hid from yourself. Yeah. So you don't, you've got, now got very little data to learn from to kind of go, oh, okay, it wasn't actually that bad. And sometimes I've seen people lose weight on the weekend, still think it's a bad week because they didn't track it to the T. And I was like, well, you know, in this situation, you haven't done that bad at all. But let's just find out what it was. And get you to the point where you get you, you get you take away this, if it's off plan on paper, it's bad. No, 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 no. It's workable. And sometimes we learn lessons from, okay, have you noticed every time you go out, you're having a bit of chocolate? You just want a bit of chocolate in your day. Yeah, I'd love that. Cool. Problem solved. But people don't want to ask that because they think it means they're not being all in and, and being perfect, which is, is another thing that, that plays a lot of people. Um, so in fact, you say that. I've uh, just had a new client start with me last week. So I became friends with him on my fitness pal and everything. And he said his calories are great, like <clears throat> really good food choices, everything, fitness proofing target, nailing it. And I actually looked through it and there was no snacks. There was no like, there was no chocolate bar. There was no sweets or anything like that. So I actually messaged him and I was like, by the way, this is going to be really weird, but are you craving any sweets? Are you craving any chocolate and stuff? Because there's none in your track or anything. There's no crisp. There's no, none of those fun foods, shall we say, in inverted commas. And I was like, I am actually craving something like that because I've not really been having it. I was like, yeah, add them in. Like, please add them in. Yeah. Because you are going to break. Yeah. Simple as that. It's like from experience again, I know if I don't have them in my diet, I'm going to be the exact same and I'm going to binge at some point. So yeah. please add them in. And I think that's probably one of the weirdest messages he probably got from me. It was like, you want me to eat sweets or you want me to eat chocolate? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to be normal, dude. I don't want yeah. you to be eating out of Tupperware every day in life. Like, please have something. <laughs> yeah, and and this, this is where that term sustainability is, is, is misunderstood, right? Because people, when, 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 when people hear us going, diets aren't meant to be sustainable, which means you should have chicken and broccoli for six weeks and then, then do the opposite, <laughs> right? So but it is that ability like, okay, let's find something that you can generally enjoy nice, most of the time, but understand that it's not forever. And sometimes when I, when I see a client say they want a sustainable approach on day one, my biggest fear is that they kind of want to do what they've already been doing, but get a different result. It's that mm. I fancy a cookie, so I'm just going to have a cookie and not track it because, you know, it's sustainable. And then you have five or six of those a week. And then you, you know, you add a thousand calories onto your week. Whereas as opposed to, right, no, we can put that cookie in, but understand that this has got to work within the plan that you're having. And this is where that sustainability, you can't just throw caution to win, just wing it and just hope for the best. Like when it comes to what, what are your, what are your thoughts on sustainability when it comes to diet? It seems like the Holy grail of what people are after, but I don't actually think it's, it's even good for people to obtain. No, I think because people are like, there's, there's someone that goes on the internet and goes talks about it saying like, I, 
a good diet is one that you can see yourself doing it from a year from now. And I'm like, okay, right. But I don't want to be dying from a year from now. Mm. You know, I want to do this. I'm not saying I want to do it as quick as possible because I think if you set yourself up for that, that can be a wee bit of, you know, that can be a wee bit of a disaster that doing it as quick as possible sometimes. Sometimes. There's nothing wrong with fast battles. Nothing wrong, in my opinion. No, me neither. Um, so I'll bring another client up for this. We were dieting. He dieted for about 18 weeks. Incidentally, actually just um, in line with my diet as well. And uh, there was on week 15, he was like, I was like to him, like, where do you want to go with this? And he was like, well, I still want to lose a bit of body fat and stuff like that. And I was like, right, your calories are quite low, but we can go lower if you feel okay about it. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, well, what do you mean by feel okay about it? It was like, right, well, if we put this lower, it's going to be quite drastic. You know, he's down at about 1,500 if we did this. Uh, but there's a couple of points to this. When you start to feel like shit, you need to tell me. When you feel like you're going to break, you need to tell me. You know, if your training goes to crap, and your life goes to crap, like you can't work and stuff, or get to that point where you're like, your energy's that drain, I should say, you need to tell me. And I was like, okay, yeah, cool. So we ended up doing it for three weeks. This dude was a machine. Every single time I saw him, I was like, I'm fine. And I'm like, how are you fine? But he was 100% sticking to it because his weight went like that and his progress pictures as well. And so on, I was like, geez, okay, that's impressive. And that's the thing. It's like going down to that last bit there, but then come back out of it. Because you don't want to stay like that. You want to get it done and then start building your new life of how many calories you can get up to what. So we went down, me and you went down to 1,600, and now I'm up to 2,900. And yeah, okay, I've put a wee bit of body fat on, but I've not ballooned or anything. Far from it. No, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, and realistically, most people <laughs> just live a really good life eating between 2,800 and 3,000 calories a day. Mm. You know, that's a good amount of food. You know, some days I'm sitting there on my phone being like, on my fitness pal being like, I need to get food then. <laughs> like shit. <laughs> and you're gonna get, so you're, that's only going to become a bigger issue where there is we push into a more hypertrophy cycle. Well, this is it. And this is the thing. If you go into it being like, okay, I want to get this done instead of, oh, I'm going to be sustainable. I'm going to want to do this from a year from now like this. You're just going to sit in this limbo of nothing really happening. Get in and get out. If it takes you six months, if it takes you a year, fine. If it takes you eight weeks, fine. If it takes you 12 weeks, fine. Don't get so fixated on how long it's going to actually take itself, but just try to get it done quite quickly yeah. in the sense of like, because then you can start living again. It, it, exactly. and Because I, I think as well, people people look at sustainability over a day rather than zooming out, look at sustainability over a month and over a year, over something else. So I, I would much rather go, right, let's do six weeks. If you... If, it's about looking at expectations. You mentioned fat, fast fat loss or slow fat loss. I'd rather mm-hmm. go, okay, you want to lose half a percent of your body weight per week. This is the expectations I would need from you. Can you achieve? Mm-hmm. If you want 1% drop per week, this is what I expect from you. If you want 1.5, it'll be quicker, but there's more I expect. And yeah. you make that choice. And any of this is fine. Generally recommend a slap bang in the middle around 1%. But generally any of this is fine. But you set this expectation, you know what you need to achieve. And I'd rather do six weeks hard a week off a maintenance, six weeks hard, week off a maintenance, then try and feel that you've got to do this diet for a year because that guy you spoke about being at 1,500 calories, he was a machine probably only because he had this short window of doing it. If you said, right, this is your life now, 1,500, (laughs) no way he's sticking to that amount of food. And if if you take that picture of zooming out, it's like if you're thinking that your diet has to be sustainable, as we said earlier on, you have this thing where you can never truly enjoy an event. You being able to say no to an event for a period of six to 10 weeks in order to get some body fat off, what's six to 10 weeks in the grand scheme of an 85 odd year life? But to allow you down the line to be able to have a completely guilt free meal out with your friends, go out to a pizza place and be able to enjoy the other aspects of life because you're not in a dieting phase anymore, rather than always having in the head of like, okay, so this is that many calories. And if I have to do yeah. that, in that totally. that's, I would rather you go, right, let's just go in. You have that mentality, get as much out of it as possible. So you don't end up in this limbo thinking, why am I not losing? Because you're not committing and then come out and then you can pull back and then maybe start to move away from tracking every macro down the path to like maybe tracking three, you know, tracking six days out of seven, maybe adding a bigger range, like 500 to a thousand calorie ranges, maybe looking at intuitive eating, like moving down this path away from strict rigid tracking 
as you sort of get out of that. You know, like, and I think a lot of people try and do everything at once rather than looking at this as a cyclical thing. You know, in if we're looking from a health perspective, a physiology perspective, if you drove into a deficit, there are good things that happen. Often blood pressure lowers, depending on what you do, of course. Cholesterol, you know, comes down in, you know, um, thing, things like insulin sensitivity improves. Fat loss happens, all good stuff. But you also see lowers in thyroid, lowers in testosterone. If you flip that and go into a muscle building phase, yeah, you build some tissue, but you might get a little bit softer. You you increase in thyroid and testosterone, but insulin sensitivity eventually will go down. Cholesterol will have issues. So when you look at it from a health perspective, a physiological perspective, you say that the best thing is to bounce between the two yeah. to allow you to sort of balance everything from a health perspective. But from a mentality perspective, it's exactly the same way. It's, right, let's spend a bit of time here to achieve what we want. And let's spend a bit of time on the other end of the spectrum to achieve what we want. And I see a lot of time when people look at, you go back to social media, you said about people look, having inspiration from people and they go, I want to look like that at the end of a diet. What people don't see, I, I get this when people go into a muscle building phase and they're really hesitant about putting on any body fat. And I, and I always show them, I've got um, a mentee, an old mentee of mine called Kevin, who's put on a lot of muscle mass. And I show him, look, he put on a good chunk of body fat. Like he was, you know, big round face and a bit soft at the start of his prep. But he spent a year after his diet putting on some body fat to allow him to put on some tissue. And then he dieted again. And he looked better. But mm. people don't see that middle ground. They don't see the softer side. So they assume that once you're dieting now, I'm going to put on that muscle and stay as lean as I am. And it's just, you're setting yourself up for failure. And in turn, you're not going to gain any muscle if you're attempting that. Like, what do you say going into the after the diet stuff? Let's talk about the post-diet stuff. And before we talk about the immediate post-diet stuff that kind of you're going through now, mm. With your guys that want to build muscle, here's the question I generally ask. Do people really want to build muscle as much as they say they do? That's a good question. It, I'm not sure, really. It's, it's one of these things that, like, <clears throat> the muscle building bit can be just as hard as kind of fat loss at times. I think it's hard as, yeah, trying to put the food up, trying to get that show, get good food without putting on body fat, as much body fat. And you know, if you kind of to get around, get down to a level where you quite like how you look and everything like that, sometimes your foot can come off the gas, you know? Like, 100%, just like going back to mine again there, I remember waking up the next day after the shoot and being a bit like, oh, I don't need to do the steps. I don't need to do the the the, the, the exercise stuff. And you're very good at like, no, no, we're jumping on the call. What's the goal right here? Which lifts do you want to improve? What do you want to do in this? You know? And uh, so, yeah, you know, there's an element of like, people have this outlook of wanting to look like your know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or whoever like that, but are they actually really wanting to do that? Mm. That's a good question. Yeah. I, I'm actually, yeah. I'd actually really need to think about that to give a better answer. Cause I, I think, I think it's different with someone like yourself, I think, because you can see, because you're a coach, you'll see the bigger picture. And I think you do want to put on some tissue. Mm. And I think in an ideal world, like saying, if you said, does anyone, if I gave you a six pack tomorrow, would you take it? Yes. But people don't, you don't always want to do the hard work associated with it. It's the same with building tissue. And the thing with building tissue, when you're dieting, yes, it's hard work. But you see, as you kind of get into a bit of momentum, you sort of see changes week on week or month on month or even day by day as you get really lean. So you're seeing the reward of your hard work. Mm. When you're building muscle. One, it's a much slower process than people like to think. Like you're, you're looking at year, really, of building tissue. You're not looking at six weeks. And... So that's a hard, mentally hard thing to do as well, because it's like we talk about the deadline importance of fat loss, but you don't, you can't really have that with building tissue. But also as you're improving, you're almost covering up your hard work. So with fat loss, you're seeing it more as you're doing it. Otherwise you're getting softer and you're hiding it all. And you've got to kind of trust it's happening. And this is why I shift people a little bit away from have half an eye on your body weight, but I don't want you so freaked out about your body weight and your condition that you don't actually put the work in because you're now, I want you now thinking about, I don't really care. I don't want to, really fluffy I, I as long as my lifts are going up i'm going in the right direction food's going up weight's gradually increasing rather than thinking so much about oh i'm losing abs losing abs losing abs because you'll pull the reverse person as soon as that happens but i do think because of that that most pe general day-to-day -day people would just like to be able to have a drink have an occasional date night out with a missus and not get fat rather than actually wanting to put on any muscle because if you generally want to commit to putting muscle, you've got to be okay with saying goodbye to your abs. 
And I don't think most people are willing to do that. And I don't think most people are really willing to drive their food up, prioritize their training to the point that it's needed to put on tissue over the long term. And I think a long term maintenance strategy for most people, I'm putting on a very gradual bit of tissue is probably what most people actually really want without yeah. getting to the point of, I want everything at, at once, which is just not achievable. So that before picture that I've sent you that, you know, the before and after, that is mm. the, the end of a build phase of two years. Do you know what I mean? So like, you look, let's be realistic. You look at that before picture and it's not that bad. You know, I'm obviously not that conditioned or whatever like that, but you know, it's fine. I've obviously got quite a bit of body fat compared to what I've got now. But that was two years worth of going into the gym and putting it and just accepting that I'm going to put a bit of body fat on. And you're right. The more I think about this, it is. It's mentally being a bit like you take your top off. And, oh, well, I can't really see my abs. They're kind of there. They're not really there. Yeah. You know, if I tend really hard <laughs> to the point of passing out, I might Good lighting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you find that, you know, the shops where the lighting's good when the change rooms, you're like, oh, I'm going to buy from there all the time. Mate, why do you think I put down lights in my hallway from the progress <laughs> pictures? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You know, so that was two years of just accepting that I'm not going to be, you know, like ready to go on holiday or anything like this right now. And yeah, most people probably don't want to do that. When I've got a client that says to me, I want to build muscle, like that's my main goal. It's like, cool, let's have a year. Like, oh, what, what about the standard 12 weeks? Like, mate, I can do good fat loss results unless you're a very untrained individual you're not going to be putting that much muscle on in 12 weeks, hmm. except that it's going to take a year, except it's going to take a year of being adherent, you know, not a year of going to the gym once a week, I, I, you know, at least free minimum. Hmm. It, realistically, I'd like, if someone's trying to build muscle, if they can give me four days in the gym, Great. that's better. Yeah. You know, free is fine. And it's probably the most realistic for most people, you know, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then they have the weekend off. They've got, you know, they're, they're training less days than they are. Yes. You know? But if you can give me four days and you stick at this for a year and you really commit to this, then we're going to build muscle, like serious muscle. And you're going to be like, diet down. You're like, fuck, I made a big change. You know, but you give me 12 weeks of your life and you want to build muscle from that. I'm like, we can try, but I'm not going to say that you're going to see a drastic change. You might see a good change, but you're not going to be like, wow. And if you're truly building tissue, you're hiding the change. So you yeah. kind of got to trust that it's happening from the lifts that you're doing rather than being able to truly see it. If, I, if you said to me, you've got 12 weeks of your life and I want to look bigger, I get you leaner. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Well, this is it. This is what some people have been a bit like. Be, and when they've seen like um, how big my arms got, there's one comment someone said to me. I was like, well, they're smaller than the before picture, but cool, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I get, <laughs> I get that a lot. Like, uh, people say that to me in my shoots and often I, I often have a side pose for, for my after for a lot of my after photos and the reason why is because that suits the fact i've got a narrow waist and i've got relatively narrow shoulders but if i turn to quarter turn all of a sudden my shoulders are wider my waist appears as narrow it makes me look bigger but oh man you built loads of size no i just i'm, I'm just not as fat it's like mate, my t-shirts are drowning me right now do you know what i mean it's like that sort of thing not so much now but i remember like last week before it um you know, my t-shirts, I was like, oh, mentally that was difficult. My t-shirts won't fit me as well. Being only five foot eight and uh, having a small t-shirt as it is, I'm like, this is looking like a, you know, like a drowned rat right now in this. Mentally that's difficult. And, you know, then people are like, oh, your arms are looking huge and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> with a pump and the shirt off and no reference points, you know, I'm not standing uh -huh. with a big dude. 100%. And that's... Go on, go on. Like, no, and that's kind of the thing with it as well. People kind of need to kind of realise with it is that, you know, you will be bigger in the before photos with that sort of thing with dieting. It's just how you look, because you look leaner. You can make someone look bigger from that. Yeah. I, and I also think it's a really important thing as well, right? Because a lot of, I think there's a problem that guys face more than anyone else is that they'll get mm. things like we said earlier. It's often when they get too close to a, uh, a 10. So I don't want to go below 80 or I don't want to go below 70. And or their t-shirts start drowning them, as you said, for yourself, is that people get freak out when they feel that level of being feeling flat and they go, oh, I'm losing muscle, I'm getting skinny. And they immediately reverse on the diet and they easily pull the plug and they self-sabotage. And these people, unless they change that mindset, will never, ever, 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 ever see their abs. Yeah, I think I, I did a post on that. Mm. Yeah, I did a post on that basically saying, like, you need to pick one and just go for it. Otherwise, you're going to be in this limbo phase mm. and you're just not going to do anything. Mm. Like you kind of every want to lose time you hit that middle ground, you're going to reverse yeah. every single time. And being flat is an inevitable part of dieting. 
no matter how well you do it, no matter how high your carbs are, it is it is is an absolutely like you're dieting. You're gonna feel flat. If your lifts are going up, you're not losing muscle. And that's a mm. big thing that people don't understand. And that that stops so many guys actually achieving it because as soon as you feel again, it's that temporary delay gratification. Yes, I feel smaller than I'd like to feel, but it's okay because I'll carb up on the day. I'll come out of a dieting phase and look bigger. Like it's okay. But this is where this is where having <clears throat> that um that extra p- uh, set of eyes helps. Mm. You know, I was hundred percent thinking like, "Fuck, I look like shit right now" because I'm having like carb, you know, completely depleted and everything. And I was like, "No, no, no, it's fine." Like he knows what he's doing. I'm just gonna if he tells me to do this, I'm just gonna do it and accept it. And that's it. Fine. You know what you're doing. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing this. And then yeah, like you say, put carbs in. You get a bit of a pump. You're like, right, I feel fantastic again. You know. Yeah. But it's having those extra eyes. So you can take the emotional decision out of it. Mm. Talk me through. Talk me through that last week because I, 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 looking at looking at that as an example, right? You carved up exceptionally well, yeah. like like better than I thought you were going to. Um, you know, like we didn't really change anything in the pet. I normally have to, I, I tweak and adjust and throw things up. You literally ran it as we planned it and absolutely nailed it. So talk me through how like this last week. How did it feel like physically, emotionally? Like how how was this process for you? First time you've done it. As a, as a, yeah, I hate using that term, but yeah, yeah. So it was, <laughs> it was stressful because it was the first time kind of doing it, and it was very much like, well, I don't actually know 100 percent what I'm doing here. I am very much putting all my trust in someone else, mm. you know. And this is where it comes to being like, okay, you've done it, so this is great. You know, he's hardly going to fuck this up for me, right? So just accept not, it, not deliberately anyway. No, <laughs> <laughs> and just accept it, just go with it. <laughs> and uh, it was funny because I kind of told you about that on the Saturday. My check in, I had uh, I chipped my tooth. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going for a photo shoot. I've chipped my front tooth. I'm stressed out. I had a bloody panic attack in the middle of the bathroom floor. Bear in mind, my missus had a big CrossFit competition that day as well. So, you know, she's just a bit like, I can't deal with this right now. You're yeah. stressed out to hell. I was like, yeah, bro, this is a good start. Um, so it was, the, the, the calories were really, really low for the 16, down to 1600, give it 1645, I think it was, exactly. And that happened. And then it was fine. Because it was only till the Tuesday, it was four days, you're like, we'll just get through it. And actually it was fine because I was like, well, it's four days. It's over the weekend. We're not doing much over this weekend. Then I've got work on Monday. That's going to distract me. And then Tuesday again, I think, did the calories go up on Tuesday slightly? No, no, I don't think so. So we did, we did a, we did a, we did a sort of semi front load, right? So we started the calories, the highest carb that was the day one, right? So yeah. three days out and then we sort of bring down a little bit and i think i gave you a little bit more on the last day just because you you dropped yeah. on the first, yeah. first cover so it was just getting through that and but again going back to having that deadline of just four days made it so much easier to yeah. then bringing it back up and uh on the on the wednesday and yeah waking up the next day and being like shit <laughs> but this is mental how much of a difference that does just having those carbs because i've never done that before when i've gone on holiday i've never you know had to peak for anything and just get lean um, and you never need to get that lean for a holiday. Obviously, you get a bit of your abs showing, and you're probably going to look good for your top off. Um, so yeah, it was a weird, it was an interesting experience, and it's a really interesting one to kind of understand more about food. Because yeah, you can say things like, "Oh, it doesn't really matter; it's just calories and calories out." But well, what you eat is going to affect that as well. What it's going to do is your body. Why do you feel so bloated even though you ate two thousand calories? You look at it, and you've just it's two thousand calories of carbs. That's maybe why you feel a bit bloated. Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? You reduce carbs but keep the calories the same, you might feel better. You know, why am I so hungry? Oh, because my protein's down at like 10. Like, right, okay, bump that up and keep the calories the same. We spoke about this earlier. All oh, right, I'm, I'm, I'm not as hungry. So it's been a really good learning curve to kind of do it first time to myself to actually, so what you eat influences how you're going to feel and how you're going to react to it. Yeah. You know? I, I always tend to feel that the last few days we start bringing carbs up after being so depleted, you feel so <laughs> good. And, and like the, what, one of the biggest things I feel about the last week is like the more we can, and the chip tooth wasn't ideal. The more you can relax, the better the process is going to be. I've seen, I've, I've spent a lot of time around bodybuilders and the people that mess it up on the day, it's never a carb issue. It's a, I've stressed out about something or a food didn't react. react. I didn't new food and it didn't react well with me. It was mm. something that stressed out the system. So like, I'm very much like the biggest, the first thing I always do is like in any peak week plan, I start from the, the shoot day and work backwards and go right the night before do nothing no training <laughs> relax nothing Ch- chill out and um, because you're you're going to be a little bit stressed anyway 
because yeah. it's the first shoot, you got it tomorrow, you want to look good. I remember my last one this year, I got my tan, and obviously the tan place had shut. And I was in the evening, I was just doing my car, but, and this is gross, but I sneezed. And I had a bit of snot come down my, up my nose, land on my stomach, and a line that ruined my tan. No. Thankfully, I blended it a little bit. I had the t- a tan place on WhatsApp, blend it a little bit, but it was right down like the vena cava. So it was like, it was like okay, it sort of worked, but I was freaking out. I was like, we're going to have this random line. You kind of see it on some of the shots that it's, it's still sort of there. So there's always going to be something that stresses you out, but like, the more you can sort of relax going into it, the, the, by far the better it's going to be. And I think the biggest thing as well is also not, even though it worked really well for you, I think the biggest caveat to us talking about peak week for anyone's listening that thinks about it is I've had it before when people have gone, oh, sorry, what do you do for a peak week? And I go on their Instagram and I go, for you, six more weeks of dieting. Yeah. You know, like if you're not lean enough, like none of the stuff we did on that last week would have made any difference if you were five kilos heavier. Yeah, 100%. This Absolutely is it. Absolutely not. If you're not ready, on that last week already, there's no point doing extra week of dieting. Yeah, I remember the as well. <laughs> going back to the tan thing as well. The same day, the Saturday, I got a voicemail from the place I was meant to get my spray tan, and the voice note basically read, um, "Oh, by the way, we don't do spray tans anymore. It's going to be a problem tan thing. Are you still okay with this?" And I was like, "Well, this is three days out." <laughs> So I phoned them up and I was just like, look, what's the difference? What's this? Is it going to make any difference? Well, no, it can be the exact same kind of result. Um, I can guarantee it will be. I was like, can you promise me that it'll look okay? Like, I've never done anything like this before. Yeah. It's for a photo shoot. I'm stressed out my mind. Can you promise me that this is going to look like a spray tan? I'm like, yeah, no, I can 100% promise. Right, okay, sound. And I was kind of speaking to the missus about it as well because she's obviously more about tans than I know anything about it. And she was like, that nah, should look fine as well. I'm like, right, okay. So rock up it. I couldn't find anyone in Starling. I ended up going into a hairdresser's. So there's me with my baggy top on and everything like that. And then uh, getting rubbed down by someone in spray tan. I was like, this is one of the weirdest experiences of my life. You know, sitting there trying to make awkward conversations. Like, oh, are you going anywhere on holiday this week? You know, I, have. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God. So, yeah, that was another stress. So. That was, I, 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 I always, this is the reason why I absolutely have so much time for James Hogg. I know you listened to the episode of the show when I had him on. He's, he's, he's brilliant, right? It's a really and, good podcast. Episode. Yeah, yeah. Really nice guy. Really smart. Knows his product really well. But I don't think he might mind me saying this. He's one of the campus individuals I've ever met my whole entire life. <laughs> and it helps because he's like, yeah. like, it's not a, you know, you need to lift your arm. Can you lift your arm? He's like, can you do this? And for the people on the audio, it's a full body swish. And he fills you with compliments. I remember going in there the first time and, have done any magazine modeling? I'm like, no, you should. You'd be really good at it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get another tan. I'm going to get one another week. <laughs> actually, this reminds me, actually, he did offer me a free tan at the end of the show last week. So I'm going to try and like, no, I've got no reason to have one, but just networking for the sake of spending time with somebody that's quite influential. It's worth it. Um, <laughs> pardon me, that's COVID coming out. Last of the last of the while. Um, but going into like, so you had your shoot, post shoot, photos looked amazing. Um, how did you find the shoot itself on that day? I mean, never done one before. Because I know you were a little bit nervous about doing it. You thought you'd be feel a bit weird. How was the day? Weirdly fun. Um, I've said this to a few people now when they've asked me about it. It's like, how do you feel about having your top off in the gym now? Because I'm not that guy that like walks around the gym with a top off or anything like that. And uh, wrong, I'll wear a vest and stuff. But like, I still kind of feel a bit like, you know, there's change rooms. So I'm going to go change my top off in the change room and stuff like that. Because of the atmosphere of what the gym was like, it was like a very, it's a very, very bodybuilding gym. It's cool. If you're in Scotland, worth going down to. And um, it was just, it was so relaxed. Because of, I will credit the photographer, TT Images, with this, though, because he's still like, right, do this, do this, do this. You don't have any time to think about being embarrassed or anything like that. He's like, right, do this, right, tense for me. And then he looks at the camera and like, right, do that again, but just slightly twist and tense again. So you don't have any time to kind of think about, oh, my God, I feel so self-conscious with my top off right now. And then, you know, as it kind of went on, I was like, no, I want a, I want a photo doing this. And he's like, yeah, cool, we'll do that. You know, and he's very encouraging. I'm like, yeah, we can try this. And they were like, oh, can we try this one? He's like, yeah, but I've tried it before, but you can't get your abs to show. So you might want to do it this way instead. And it becomes like almost like a wee bit of a team effort. But credit where it's due, that first 10, 20 minutes, where he was just like almost took control of it and being like, do this, do this. It totally relaxed me. Hmm. And if anyone thinks that it's such a weird kind of thing to do, it is weirdly fun. I, don't, I, I can't describe why, but if anyone's done a photo shoot, they maybe understand it. Um, and it's also really tiring. Like you come out because you're tensing like hell as well. <laughs> and you're like, shit, I've just done an hour's workout. Do you know what I mean? Because you're sitting there trying to tense it. And that's why you don't, 
like try and load loads of things up with heavy weights or whatever like that because you know you're going to be like 10 minutes in and like dead like yeah. why did i load that up to 150 <laughs> kilo deadlift up on the bar for a photo yeah. i should could have just done with 20s on. it's always the embarrassing thing right you know you can press the 40s and then all of a sudden all your photos show you pressing 15s yeah <laughs> my deadlift with 60 kilos on the bar and all my shots i'm like oh dear me yeah well this is it i remember because i kind of i went in with a few ideas on my phone of what i kind of wanted and one of them i was like i don't it was like on my notes it's like i just need to get my legs in it i don't care what the shoot is i want my legs in it we kind of tried it on the i don't know what it's called like a v squat yeah and my quads weren't coming out and i was like can we try trap bar deadlift or else i don't know it might work and kind of tried it and i was like that's still not and he was just like go and roll your shorts up and see it and it was like that one and i was like oh yeah okay that does look good and so that was like the shot where i was just like there's a shot from the lens i sent you mm, i think you yes. put it in your reel the last one that's the photo where it was kind of like okay yeah uh, this looks fucking great yeah. <laughs> i remember you being happy about the quads and, I, and, and that's that's the big thing is you don't often see your quads because when you're training them there's a level of information there's blood around the around the surface but reason why this is the reason why on your last you know few days of your peak week is like take legs out the last half of the week let inflammation die down and all of a sudden that's when you kind of like a day or so before you're like oh my god i can see all the muscles in my legs yeah. it's because we stopped training them you know obviously you can't do it all the time because you need to train them to grow but just taking away that blood and water retention from the surface and that's why you you, you do a little bit of a pump but you don't want to take anything to failure on the days prior you don't want because it'll just blur definition away mm. so moving on just to cl- close off moving on to like the diet after the diet and you see alluded to it earlier on having that almost what people call gold medal syndrome where people finish a diet and it's like and then monday this happens you, you every bit of the fourth of your mind everything has been building to this day mm. and the next day happens it's just like like the day before but now with the deadline pulled off you know how did that feel and what do you think is the importance because obviously we got in a call and we obviously said like we're gonna for a period of time we're gonna go back to tracking and like make sure we keep the habits that we built up whilst building up to maintenance calories so we don't just go off the other way how do you feel coming out of that dieting phase and what is the importance of going back to structure yeah, so like I kind of said earlier, like I woke up that next day and I was like, huh, I don't need to do anything anymore. Like there's no like, what, what's the goal right now? And I was quite fortunate because I always knew like this wasn't the complete end. Like I want to then go in and make that look small next time. If I ever do decide to do it again, I'm not saying I will. You know, I want to go back in. I want to get my list back up. Um, I want to be able to, you know, get goals, my deadlift, my squat, my bench and things like that. I want to get them up. And uh I mean, like say credit where it's due with you as well it's like right let's jump on a call we need to talk about this to make sure you don't go backwards and you know to kind of even have it in a structure of like you know like right this is a build phase now what are the main goals what you want to kind of achieve now you know and kind of before the call i kind of had a bit of an idea what i kind of want to do things like that and that's kind of the biggest thing is to not throw structure completely out just because the goal's over you know still the whole point as well like we've kind of talked a wee bit about like unsustainable methods and stuff but you still need to build, try and build habits at the same time. Like, fair enough with it. It might be an unsustainable deficit, but it should be sustainable in the sense of, like, you're going to still want to have protein every meal. You're still going to want to eat your vegetables. You're still going to want to do steps, you know, to an extent. So it's definitely that. It's to come, go in, fair enough, have a couple of days of kind of relaxing because it's been full on, but you need to be a bit like, right, what's next? What's the goal now? You know, what What do I want to get out of this? Because if we don't have goals, we don't, just in anything in general, if you don't have something to kind of work towards, you don't do any work, bottom line. <laughs> I, I, I always say this, like, I don't mind the goal being maintenance, but I don't feel, I feel that people fall into this maintenance trap. If you're going into training with a goal of maintenance, mm. no one goes, oh man, I can't wait to maintain my bench press this week. <laughs> like, no one's fired up for that, right? So like, Technically, right now, you're in what I call a replenish phase, which is they see a reverse diet maintenance phase, right? Maybe just pushing in now into a proper building phase. Now, even though the goal for now is to sort of hold close to your top condition for a, you know, a couple of months and allow you to keep the habits that, that you have to do dieting without the deadline, even though that is the goal, that's not the goal of training. We go into training with that same mentality that we will do carry us into the building phase. The only thing that will change then is the food. And I, I'm generally a firm believer that I'll start to give people more flexibility and structure with their food when they don't feel they want it. Like right now, when you finish a diet phase, you want to go, well, I'm dieting for ages now. I just don't want to, I don't want to track. 
okay, this is the time where that's dangerous. I, I'm now going, okay, we're going to bring your, bring your food up, give you way more flexibility. Like we didn't keep you on 17, 1800 calories. You brought your food up, you know, quite considerably in that first day after the shoot. Yeah. But it's sort of like, okay, in that time, I, I, I want to take, I have a number of different ways I reverse diet and that's a different podcast, a different day, but the, like, have that period of time. Okay. You keep those habits, you keep that structure. And when you're at the point where you don't need the accountability to do those things is the time when it's probably start good time to start moving away from it. Yeah. Because that's the time then when we can pull back and go, if you do want to track, you're not going to, Oh man, I don't want to go to tracking again. You were so happy doing it anyway, that if you go back to it, it's fine. Yeah. That's, that's another thing that flexibility. Sorry. So you off, but that's what I think true flexibility yeah. is. People think true flexibility is being able to intuitively eat. I think true flexibility is being able to go, move away from tracking without fear and guilt and go to tracking without fear and guilt. Neither are yeah. bad, like neither food is bad, but you can just bounce between the two depending on what the goal is of that time. Yeah, I mean, that's it's such a big thing because everyone's kind of making a big deal about like having calories on meal uh, menus and things like that at the moment. And if it's going to make it better, and that's, again, conversation for a different day. But if you've got all these tools in your toolbox, you don't need to use them all the time. They're just there if you want to, you know, it's like, right. Okay. You let's be realistic. It's going to help dieting, have them on menus and things like that. It's also calorie counting. It also helps a lot of people. Sometimes it doesn't, right. Fair enough. Again, conversation with a different day. But if you know how to do all these things, when it comes to being like, right, I want to lose a bit of body fat, it's easier, mm. but it doesn't mean you need to use it all the time. It's just a case of like, right. Okay. I've probably been eating a bit stupidly at the moment. Let's rein that in a bit. And I know how to with ease. I can just click into it. You know, and that's the biggest thing as well is like, you don't need to use all these tools all the time, but you do need to know how to use them. Yes. And people talk about emo- like tracking calories. It causes a bad relation with food. I'm like, no, 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 no. Your current emotional state is a bad, it has already has the bad relation with food. Mm. And putting tracking on top of that probably isn't necessarily helpful at this stage. But tracking itself isn't the problem. In the same way, that an alcoholic, alcohol necessarily, a beer isn't necessarily the issue. Otherwise, no one would be a have a beer because it'd be so detrimental to everyone's mindset. But the, the difference in you and someone that can't put the beer down is something going on in their life with their emotional state. And I think we, we, we tend to, again, I think dieting lives in this really weird realm where people don't view it in the same way as any other aspect of life. And like tracking is this like it's tracking that caused the babylation food. Is it? It might have been a contributing factor, but I don't think track is to blame because there's plenty of people that track and have no issues with food. There's plenty of people that track that improve the relationship with food because they now become more aware of their food. And it's it's so when I look at getting somebody to a point where they're emotionally in a good place with food, it's like, right, how do I get to a point where you can use tools and take away tools without an emotional connection? where you're not scared of, oh, tracking's bad, I shouldn't do that, or intuitive eating's terrible because I just I go off the rails. How do we get to the point where you can kind of do both? And it just depends on the goal you'd need. It's, it, no one said, um, I, I don't do um, German volume training because it, it's going to give me a bad relationship with training. You know, yeah, like, no one says it. that. But we expect the same thing with the tools that we use for nutrition. Yeah, that's it. No, it's, it's a different one because everyone's got an opinion on it. Food is so so hotly you know discussed like you know yourself being a pt you can't go anywhere without someone bringing it up like other jobs and stuff um you can go away somewhere and you have a bit of a conversation that's that but with our jobs everyone's got an opinion on what it is right and it can get really hotly discussed and you're like i'm just at a barbecue can i just can i just eat this in peace and not get judged for it please right now or you you get the person at that barbecue who thinks they know more than you oh yeah it's carbs You don't get that. You don't get that with accountants, do you? Going, I don't think you know much about money at all. Here's how I manage my finance. Yeah. <laughs> no one does that to an accountant. No one does that to a doctor. No one goes, well, let me tell you what I think the cure to cancer is. Like, <laughs> like, but but with, with, with personal training, everyone goes, now, it's the carbs, isn't it? Definitely the carbs. I disagree with you. You know, like, I'm sitting there with a Coke Zero, and someone comes to me and goes, she should be drinking that. I'm like, oh, go away. Yeah. I, I've gotten to the point where I just like agree with them. Yeah, cool, whatever. And just not get into that argument. It was like, you know what? They've got an opinion and me and you talking about it. It's just not, it's not going to change. You've not come to me asking for help. You've come to me to say what's up. 
<laughs> but, but yeah, to I'm show like, that I know more than the PT. I'm like, oh, yeah. good for you. I'm, I'm glad you think so. And, well, that's and it. maybe you do. I'm not proud. I've still yeah. learned. Like, yeah, fair enough. Maybe, maybe you do this as a hobby and you've done it for 20 years. I don't know. But when you come to me telling me Diet Coke's the problem, then I'm probably not going to listen. But that's also my emotional yeah. connection to Diet Coke. I get through so many of them a day that um, – I'm not going to listen to anyone that says anything bad about Asparto. <laughs> well, I'm I'm a I'm a Pepsi man, so I'm slightly judging you for your diet coke, but it's fine. <laughs> oh, dear me, dear me, it's just not. It, it, it tastes more artificial. Think? Okay. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, the only time I'll ever, the only time I'll ever have a Pepsi Max is when um, I'm going to my other guilty pleasure, a Subway sandwich. Subways are amazing, to be fair, though. Cookies are the best. Yeah, they are. Yeah. But again, Subway, people look at it and be like, oh, can't have that in your diet. And it's like, well, you look at it, you can customise it to such a way that you can. Don't get me wrong, you can customise it in such a way that it's like, oh, as a bomb scare. Yeah, absolutely. But, two cookie pies, two, yeah. two pies, all the sauce. Yeah. yeah. 100% foot long, double cheese. That's the one. I think that's going to be lunch today, actually, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> So just, just, just to close off, this has been a really, really interesting chat. I think we've covered some really, really good points. Um, so just to close off, what if there was one bit of advice you give to someone that's thinking I want to do a photo shoot um, and one lesson that you've learned you think would help them, what would it be? Get accountability is the biggest first one. I don't care how much you know, get another set of eyes on it so that you completely remove the emotions of it. And I would say someone that you're not particularly close to either. Do you know what I mean? Like not another coach that you're kind of friendly with or anything like that. Get someone that's going to tell you what's up tell you it black and white and that's it um biggest thing from learning biggest thing i've learned from it is structuring your day is probably going to be the best thing for it as in like i've not said that very well as in like you can do the steps everyone can do the steps everyone's got 24 hours in the day you just need to start structuring it more i remember looking at it thinking like christ i've got four bites of cardio to do i've got four time uh, four days of weight training to do and i've got ten thousand steps a day every single day I think that's a lot. And I just kind of looked at my day and I was like, well, no, I've got a client at this time. I've got an hour between the next one. So I can literally go and walk to a coffee shop and back. That's going to get me some steps that day. And then, you know, I can fit my training in here. So that's fine. And then I can go back at night. I've got a couple hours. I can go and do my walk there and I can fit my cardio in here. And it's get structure. Like, don't try and wing any of it. Mm. Don't think that you're going to go up on Monday and be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to be able to do what I can today. And, you know, I might be able to train today. I might not be able to train today, but there's always tomorrow. Don't get into that mindset. Have it all set out, you know, so you're going to get a bit of structure from it because everyone does have the same amount of time. I don't want to get to that guy being like, oh, you don't want it bad enough or whatever like that. But you won't do it if you if you don't have it structured. Simple as that. Mm, I, I, I absolutely couldn't agree more. Talk to me about one time where you messed up your diet and how you got around it. Probably the, probably the, the Tim Hortons bit. That was definitely the biggest. The donut. the donut thing definitely kind of messed it up. Um, I mean, we can go on about like holiday where fair enough, I was probably not as on plan from that, but it was four days where I was with my missus on a holiday that we haven't been on in two years. Like, you know, <laughs> I don't feel bad about it. I didn't regret it. I was like, I have enough time to sort this. I'm going to go and have a couple of beers. I'm going to go and have, you know, cocktails. With her. We've not done this in so long that this right now in this moment is a priority over what I need to do in six weeks. And I was a bit like, I can sort this out if I'm really on it for the next six weeks, you know? Key word there being priority, right? That's, that's yeah. the, it was a holiday. It wasn't just a Saturday night you're not going to remember in six months' time. No. Um, awesome. Last one before we, we, we find out where to find you. Um, as we, we tipped onto the Subway sandwich being amazing, what is your favourite fast food joint? Now you now you don't have any real restrictions on your diet. Oh, favourite fast food joint is, I'm, I'm really easy. I'm normally a McDonald's man, mm. definitely. Easy chicken slicks. I'm really boring when it comes to it as well. So it is actually one of the healthy drops as well, but they actually taste good. I've got a lot of stick from saying that uh, I quite like the theory of fish as well. All my pals are literally like weird. <laughs> oh, again, we again we change. I'm a Burger King guy. I like the yeah. fish. Love this the Burger. Subway is my favourite fast food joint, probably. But I, I think if you, it was McDonald's or Burger King, Burger King. I like the flame grilledness to it. The biggest issue I've got with not issue but every time there's a subway in Stirling city center and you walk past it and it smells amazing so there's so many times i'm just like i didn't go in with the <laughs> saying i'm gonna get a subway but I end up coming out with one yes yeah you you, you I, I've, I've had i've been diet before because it smells so good i've altered my route that allowed me to get more steps in and avoid the subway smell yeah 100 <laughs> percent. 
Awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's been really, really enjoyable. Where can people who want to know more about you and, you know, if they're in Sterling area, get PT. Tell them about where can people find you. So I'm on Instagram at uh, underscore JHPT. Um, I've got a Facebook page, but it's not. I don't really use it particularly that much. Um, and I train a PT out of the gym called Dedicated Conditioning. So again, if you just go from my Instagram page, if you're interested in that, just go onto that and just message me. Hmm. How how far how far? Because I again, I spent so long since so I've been back up to Scotland to see family. How far are you from Edinburgh? About half an hour. The, there may, I'm not guaranteed, but there may be a chance that I'm going heading up to that way at some point in the six weeks. Okay, I'll, let, I'll let you know if, if you yeah, are. Yeah, 100%. Time. Might even be next weekend, but I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, 100%, let me know. Depends, like, depends if I test negative before then. Yeah, <laughs> you're allowed out. Yeah, exactly. Right, man, thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed the show. I think it's been really good. Cool. Cheers, Simon.